As aircraft have grown bigger, faster, and more lethal, navies have had to devise ever more ingenious ways of flying from ships. Sailors were among the first to realize that aircraft would become an indispensable part of the control of the sea. Today, the United States leads the world in naval aviation. In sheer size and in numbers of aircraft carriers, it is in a class of its own. It has 15, five of them nuclear powered. They can carry around 90 aircraft each. Naval aircraft must be tough. 30 tons of high technology jet fighter is about to be brought to a halt in just two seconds. Each landing is a fine balance between the pilot's skill and precision engineering, always on the brink of disaster. Every landing is recorded for later analysis by the pilot. Takeoff is no less finely judged. The Tomcat must reach flying speed again in just seconds using the steam power catapult. The U.S. Navy was the first to launch an aircraft from a ship in 1910. Ever since, navies have looked for better ways to get aircraft on and off ships. The Royal Navy launched Sopwith biplanes from the guns of its battleships in World War I. They had to land on shore or in the sea. To make aircraft reusable, America built seaplanes which took off from the ship and landed on the water. Getting the pilot and plane back on board was a tricky business. America's first real aircraft carrier was the USS Langley, converted from a collier in 1920. From the outset, naval aviation made enormous demands on the pilot. It was a dangerous business. Navy pilots do everything which other pilots do, but they do it from a ship. It takes a particular combination of qualities. I think that we look for independence, responsibility, someone who can think well on his feet, someone who is willing to take a chance, wants to excel. I think that if you can land a bird on a postage stamp, you can hold your head up with any pilot anywhere probably as exhilarating as it ever was. And I think those of us who do this have got enough little boy in us that uh, we can't wait to go out and get the next one. The day a Navy or Marine pilot makes his first deck landing is a milestone in his career. He will do it on board a veteran carrier from the Second World War, the USS Lexington, which steams off the coast in the Gulf of Mexico. Every naval aviator has to do it, 
and share the same experience of rising tension as the day approaches. When uh, I go home, I want to relax, but I start thinking about the boat, thinking about having to go out and land on it for the first time, never having seen it. And I can sit there, and just by thinking about this, I'll start, I'll sweat. I'll get butterflies in my stomach, and I can just work myself up into a, a big knot of tension. For about two weeks now, it's been real tough sleeping at night. Um, and uh, every, every flight you ever do in this airplane for the last six months, you end it by doing 10 or 15 landings. And uh, you're not much good to the Navy unless you can land your airplane back in the ship. Out on the Lexington, the crew prepares to receive the new pilots. Oh, gosh, when we were up there orbiting over the ship, I got my first look at it. And uh, my first thought was, look how small that ship is. It was pretty routine all the way out until I saw the ship. I was looking down at it and going, I can't believe they want me to land on that damn thing. Clear deck. Clear deck. Just a little high. Back on. I was running at the ship way, way over speed. I was low on the glide slope coming through. I added too much power, came up high, and never quite worked it down again. My hook skipped all the way down the deck with missing the fourth wire. It all happened too fast. I wasn't ready for everything that was going on. A lot of people can fly, but only a few people can fly to a carrier and land on it. I think that's just be a neat thing to be able to do. To me, that's the ultimate. Geez, I've never felt anything like that before. You stop so quick, we're just hanging in our straps. You're thrown forward so hard. And then uh, you think, I did it. I'm just real excited that I, I did it. I really did it. Didn't that feel a lot better there? Having passed one milestone, a student pilot is then immediately confronted with a second, his first carrier takeoff. With hardly a pause, he is directed very precisely over the steel deck by the crew to the takeoff point on the steam catapult. You roll up there and they, they taxi onto the catapult and you feel yourself being hooked up. And when they put uh, steam pressure on the catapult, your plane kind of squats down. And that means the catapult's under tension. And you're about ready to go. Run the power up, check everything out, give the catapult officer a salute, and there's about a three-second pause. And you put your head back, and I had no idea what to expect. And you go screaming down this catapult, and it felt like someone just punched my whole body. And a yell just came out of me. I didn't, didn't really mean to do it. I just went, yeah, right off the end of the catapult. And then you're flying. And it was just an amazing thing. The Navy has a new pilot to join its capital ships, the big carriers which patrol the world's oceans. Before the Second World War, the capital ships of all navies were battleships. A country's stature in the world was measured by the number of its battleships. The ships were measured by the size and range of their guns. They could fling a 16-inch shell over 20 miles. Sailors quickly realized that an aircraft fitted with a torpedo could attack the enemy at an even greater range. Torpedo aircraft were developed, but many admirals still put all their faith in battleships. As the Second World War approached, the Royal Navy's aircraft were rather old.
The Ferry Swordfish was a biplane specially designed to operate from an aircraft carrier. It was the Royal Navy's standard torpedo bomber in 1939, and some were still in service at the end of the war. Its maximum speed was 138 miles per hour, only slightly faster than fighters of the previous war. It was known by its crews as the string bag. The swordfish was alloy tubing and fabric, and very little metal. It was a very light plane in relation to the pair of the engine. It meant you were very maneuverable. The pilot could literally turn it round on itself almost. Everyone seemed to like it because it, it was so easy to fly. When you're ready. It was known as a safe aircraft, which was comfortable. I never knew of one which had an engine failure or anything of that nature. You had the pilot, the observer, and I was at the rear. I had a wireless set and a Vickers gas-operated machine gun, pretty small in relation to the cannons carried by Messerschmitts. If you were to be attacked by fighters, you didn't feel you had very much of a chance. November 1940, when Britain sorely needed a victory at sea, just 21 swordfish broke the back of the Italian Navy's fleet in port at Taranto. The pilots had to be very brave and very cool. The problem was that you had to drop a torpedo terribly, terribly exactly with a mass of anti-aircraft fire directed at you. But you had to keep absolutely steady because the way that the torpedo was released was the way it was going to run. One has considerable qualms going into attacks. I myself was working the radios and I was slightly off tuned and listening to an Italian opera. I think a lot of other people were doing the same sort of thing to get their minds off. The action at Taranto showed how even old, slow aircraft could pose a deadly threat to surface ships. Bismarck put to sea, a big ship and a dangerous ship. A ship that could fall on a convoy like a wolf on a flock of sheep. But from the moment that the Bismarck weighed anchor, she was watched, trailed, and shadowed. Shadowed by irritating little specks that wouldn't be shaken off. Little specks that told the Royal Navy where the Bismarck was to be found. The Bismarck made her way through the North Sea into the Atlantic. On the 24th of May, she sank the battlecruiser HMS Hood and damaged the battleship Prince of Wales off Iceland. The Royal Navy's only hope was the swordfish. They sailed on board the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious. It was accompanied by two battleships and a cruiser squadron. As the carrier's torpedo bombers were made ready to attack, the Bismarck headed south. At the same time, another fleet with the carrier Ark Royal was heading for the North Atlantic from the Mediterranean. She was also equipped with swordfish. The swordfish crews, many of them inexperienced flying from carriers, faced a long and perilous journey to find the Bismarck. 
Swordfish crews made two decisive attacks. We were one of the first squadrons to be equipped with ASV, which was the on-aircraft radar, which enabled aircraft to locate ships at sea, or even a periscope. Of course, what we didn't know was that the Bismarck also had radar, but they'd used it for gunnery, range finding. We approached the Bismarck over the cloud, then all of a sudden, there was a burst of shell fire, and it had landed right in between the three flights. In fact, I looked through the shell fire at the other aircraft. That was the signal to attack. we were safe, all of a sudden, she ends up with her huge guns, and she was actually trying to knock us down with water spits, which is incredible, and it showed the accuracy of her guns. The swordfish did not sink the Bismarck, but they did disable her, damaging her propellers and jamming her rudder. After the attacks, the swordfish crews had to land back on the carriers in the dark. They did not know the full extent of the damage they had inflicted. The Bismarck's crew worked through the night to repair the damage, but to no avail. She steamed helplessly in slow circles. The following morning, the battleships finished her off. The sinking of the Bismarck had shown again how vulnerable surface ships were to attack from the air. It had also shown how important aircraft were for reconnaissance at sea. And Germany had no aircraft carriers, but she converted some pre-war Focke Wolf airliners into long-range maritime patrol aircraft, which they called Condor. The Condors operated from bases in France. They had a range of over 2,000 miles, staying up in the air for up to 14 hours at a time. Their primary role was to search the Atlantic for the convoys of merchant ships carrying war supplies from America to Britain and report their position and progress to the German Navy. German naval headquarters received the information and passed it on to the commanders of the U-boats, which did the real damage. was alone. The convoys were her lifeline. Without them, she could not fight the war. In the Battle of the Atlantic, the U-boats took a heavy toll. The losses mounted. The Condors not only acted as the eyes and ears for the U-boat fleet. Once they had passed their messages, they could attack the unprotected merchantmen from the air. They carried machine guns and bombs. Their speciality was to attack at low level. Britain's aircraft carriers were fully occupied protecting the Navy's warships. The attacks continued unopposed. Towards the uh, middle and end of 1940, the situation in the Atlantic uh, was becoming very serious. We were losing many ships in the convoys as a result of the German Condor. And something had to be done, and something had to be done pretty urgently. And I wrote a minute suggesting that uh, what we needed was to get fighters um, in the Atlantic and very quickly. And so I suggested putting 
hurricane fighters onto merchant ships and catapulting them with a very simple catapult. At about that time, Professor Lindemann was inventing all these rockets, and so we used them to propel the catapult. The moment of firing off is very, very frightening. You go forward with such speed that you pass out for a few seconds. Then you come off the end of the trolley and you come to, and then suddenly you found yourself flying. It was rather a peculiar sensation. The condor has about six positions of firing, and you want to keep out of the line of the fire, so if you make a head-on attack, you're going straight for the pilot. So if you could only get the pilot, then the aircraft is finished. After the action, you realize you've got to get down to your boat again somehow. And the only way you can do this is by parachuting. This is a very frightening experience, circling around the convoy for two hours, thinking in two hours' time I've got to jump out of this aircraft, and never having used a parachute in my life before, not knowing really what to do. But then I floated down 2,000 feet, which was really enjoyable, quite pleasant, and landed on the water, which was cold and miserable. <laughs> The most frightening part of all, really, is seeing the convoy still progressing and not knowing whether you're going to be picked up or not. And it's surprising how big the ocean is <laughs> under those conditions. People might think it's terrible that we sacrificed a hurricane, but I was personally more concerned about the pilots. They were very, very brave men. The catapult-launched hurricanes were only a vital stopgap. What was needed was a cheap, quick way of providing the convoys with proper fighter cover. The next step was to convert merchant ships into aircraft carriers by putting a flat steel deck right across the ship. Underneath that, the hole could still be filled with grain, oil, or general cargo as usual. These were followed by purpose-built, though still fairly rudimentary, escort carriers. To equip them with fighters, Britain converted her famous Spitfire for use at sea. It was not as successful as it had been in the Battle of Britain. It lacked both the strength and the range for naval operations. Much more effective was the American naval fighter, the Grumman Wildcat, which the Royal Navy bought in large numbers and rechristened the Martlet. Escort carriers were a great success, but they were only part of the Battle of the Atlantic. The main threat to the convoys came from U-boats, and the fighters were no good against them. The answer to the submarine menace was long-range, shore-based maritime patrol aircraft. At the extremity of the patrol, each aircraft runs east 10 miles, and then sweeps northwards and so back to its base. Royal Air Force Coastal Command was equipped with massive flying boats, short Sunderlands. They carried bombs and depth charges and bristled with machine guns. They were also equipped with radar to detect submarines on the surface. It was tremendously difficult to overcome the sheer boredom of, say, a 12-hour sortie over the Atlantic, looking at nothing but the sea. Deed up, Japs. We tried all sorts of tricks to try and keep the crew alive. We tried to make the meals as variable as possible. You tried to change round positions in the aeroplane so that a man didn't have to sit in the front turret for 12 hours. You got to change. late 1941, Coastal Command was beginning to turn the tide against the U-boats. The RAF also used American Consolidated Catalinas, which had a range of 4,000 miles. Now, when an aircraft spotted a U-boat, its task was to try and get to that U-boat as quickly as possible, because the U-boat would do its damnedest to get underwater to a depth where it was in safety. 
So it was a case of diving with all your engines flat out, everything flat out, trying to get within range of that U-boat before it could dive. If it had beaten you to it and got underwater, you had to try and guess the distance ahead of the swirl that it made as it went down the U-boat might be and try and drop your depth charges across that. Attacks were analysed by the mirror camera because if that submarine was sunk, we didn't want to waste time searching for it the next day. On the other hand, if it was only either damaged or possibly even just frightened, then you wanted to arrange your patrols, both naval and air, the next day to try and find it. The Battle of the Atlantic was won by steadily providing more and more effective air cover. Liberators flying from shore bases joined the struggle, finally closing the gap in mid-ocean where the U-boats still operated. I think I can best sum up the elation we had at the end of the submarine menace by referring to the Prime Minister's bi-weekly conference when Churchill had heard all the reports from everybody concerned. He took a cigar out of his face and sat back. Well, gentlemen, he said, now we know what the cat feels like when it's eaten the mouse. Very satisfied. Well before the Battle of the Atlantic was won, the struggle for control of the world's other great ocean, the Pacific, was underway. Japan had long planned to build an empire in Asia and the Pacific. And as part of that planning, the Japanese Navy had built up its air power. The only threat to Japanese ambitions was America. The base at Pearl Harbor gave the U.S. Navy a strategic advantage. Pearl Harbor was beyond the range of Japanese bombers. So in December 1941, Japan sent its fleet, including six aircraft carriers, to launch a surprise attack. Central to the plan was the destruction of the American aircraft carriers. For the Americans, it was a day of infamy. Four battleships were sunk along with many other ships of the fleet. But the American carriers were at sea, and they escaped. It was a sad day when Admiral Halsey, in command of the aircraft carriers returned to Pearl Harbor to see the devastation. Now, with its battleships gone, the United States Navy had to rely on its aviators to retaliate. We had this tremendous feeling of getting back at the Japanese because of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. There were things that you felt that you had to do, and you'd go beyond yourself to accomplish it, to avenge what had happened to some of your buddies. America had no immediate means of hitting back of the Japanese mainland because its bombers, too, lacked the range. So they improvised. In April 1942, the carrier Hornet brought a force of 16 B-25 Army Air Force bombers under the command of General Jimmy Doolittle within striking range of Tokyo. They bombed the city, then flew on to China. The strike inflicted only marginal damage, and there were losses. The raid was a great boost to American morale. A month later came the Battle of the Coral Sea. It showed how future sea battles would be fought. The opposing warships remained up to 200 miles apart, launching airstrikes against each other. For the first time, the outcome of a naval battle was decided entirely by aircraft. America lost the carrier USS Lexington, though many of her crew and aircraft were saved. But Japan had lost the carrier Shoho, 
and the Shikaku had been severely damaged. When the two fleets came up against each other a month later, Japanese naval air power had been weakened. The Battle of Midway was fought from the 4th to the 7th of June, 1942. American intelligence had broken the Japanese naval codes. As Admiral Yamamoto prepared to strike at Midway Island, Admiral Nimitz was able to launch a surprise attack. The Japanese carriers were on the defensive. They managed to launch their Zero fighters. By then, the first American torpedo bombers were about to attack. I saw my squadron annihilated. I knew by the time I got into torpedo range that my squadron was all gone. And I was the only one who got in close enough to drop a torpedo. And I picked out a guy on a pom-pom gun, and I flew right down his throat. And he thought I was coming right on him because he jumped off the gun just as I went over his head. I only missed it about eight feet. I got clear through the whole Japanese fleet and got out on the other side before I got shot down. The American torpedo bombers flying at low levels suffered grievous losses. The dive bombers suffered fewer casualties and inflicted more damage. The Battle of Midway was a turning point in the war. Three of Japan's large carriers were hit and the core of Japan's naval air power was destroyed. A small force of highly motivated American pilots had triumphed against the odds, buying America valuable time in which to prepare to go on the offensive. New aircraft were already in the pipeline as American industry geared itself to war. Experienced pilots returned to train a new generation of naval aviators. We were young college graduates, reasonably intelligent, physically fit, and if we weren't going to aspire to become naval aviators, which we felt was the most difficult type of aviation, if we weren't going to try to do it, then who was going to do it? I remember this one pilot that got into his seat and I strapped him in and we were talking for a wet and he, he was very wet and of course I asked him, I said, you're comfortable? He said, I'm comfortable but I, I'm perspiring because I know what I have to do. And I asked him, I said, how do you feel about taking off on this plane? He said, we're at war and if it takes my life to win this war, I'm taking off on this plane. And that's where I didn't know where he got this courage from. We were losing people, true. Do you know, inside yourself, you say, when you're young, I'm immortal, and it isn't going to happen to me. I guess on what you'd call a tour of duty, you'd lose uh, 60 or 70 percent of your people. You had to harden yourself. Otherwise, you'd go all to pieces. The particularly sad thing to me was that some men do not seem like they should have been in that position. They were such clean, wholesome men. They were the men that I thought should survive. I asked our top hero of the time, what's it like attacking a cruiser? And his answer was, have you ever looked into a blast furnace? The trick in making a good strafing attack is to get the airplane very close to the target. You come straight down, and you're standing on the rudder pedals, and you're up against your straps. Then you can give a real good burst. As America began the bloody business of evicting the Japanese from their island bases, the Marines on the ground came to rely on air support. The pilots of the attack aircraft, in turn, relied on the Navy fighter pilots to protect them. Naturally, I had fear. Anybody that doesn't have fear is an idiot. It must stimulate you, get your adrenaline going, sharpen all your senses. You must make your fear work for you. Most of it was done instinctively. The Zero had a much higher rate of climb 
down you went, down he went. You pulled up, he pulled up, and you had him. He came right up into your sights. Somebody shot at me, I, I got angry. Just made me mad, and I wanted to shoot back, not just take it. We would wait and wait for those planes to come back. There were many times when planes came in and how they were going to land was just a mystery. When a plane comes in at 120 miles an hour and they miss the arresting gear wire and they would quite frequently go clean off the island. One of the factors for the, the large number of accidents had to do with the exhaustion of the pilot. It built up in your system. You lost a lot of your sharpness. Sometimes you're not even aware of it. And so they just start losing it as they're making their approach. In the event of a plane catching fire, very, very seldom was a pilot lost because of the crew efficiency. We just didn't lose them. Very often, it would be a decision that that man should ditch rather than jeopardize the carrier because sometimes there was too much action to take time out for him to land on the deck. And then as soon as that was taken care of, they would push that aircraft over the side and we were cleared for action. American naval power was now firmly rooted in air power. Aircraft carriers were the new capital ships of the Navy which steadily advanced on Japan. Japanese sea and air power was broken. As the American fleet came closer, Japan resorted to desperate measures to stop it. At the beginning, it was, you know, gung-ho to fight and everything, but when those kamikaze started, uh, they don't want to live, and that was their mission, to die for their country. I don't know, I wasn't built that way. I wanted to live. I had my brothers and mother and father I wanted to see again. He might be hit, might be on fire, and he still follows in. Only one has to do the job. The carrier's his target. So the main thing was to get as much shell into the air as possible. And you see the black explosions out there, and the plane keeps coming. And then subconsciously, you're telling yourself, all right, if they don't get him pretty soon, now I'm going to have to shoot. It's me and him. In the Army, you could dig a hole. But in the Navy, on an aircraft carrier, you, you can't dig in steel. That flat deck was open and wide. And you knew damn well that you had to get off the flight deck and jump somewhere. So you jumped into that catwalk. And maybe there was a fellow there already, but you landed on top of him. And he grabbed you, and we held on to each other. We didn't know what the hell was happening. And then you become almost hysterical when all of the noise starts and the explosions start. And the, the engines are roaring and the guns are going off. You feel at times that you're going to explode. Every time we thought we were safe, the Japanese would just come in more and more and more. I saw guys, big strappy men, cry because they couldn't take it no more. Some of them actually jumped right off the ship. You see friends fighting fires, all of a sudden a bomb hit. You don't see your friends no more. And if we were unlucky enough to have aviation fuel in the planes, or the planes loaded with rockets or bombs on the hangar deck, the fires were tremendous. Sometimes you even had to let the fires burn out. You always knew that there were many men down there who were either killed or wounded and try to get them back up on deck. The extra volunteers 
to pack sea bags. By packing a sea bag, I mean putting bodies in them. If you don't have a complete body, you pick up what's around to make a body. And you got to pay for it. You got, I think, $1.65 a bag. The Navy suffered serious losses, but its pilots had established an overwhelming command of the air both above the fleet and in support of ground operations. Victory in the Pacific, when it came, owed an enormous debt to naval airmen. Naval air power reached its peak at the end of the war. Now a new challenge faced Navy pilots, the jet fighter. Recently, a jet-propelled aircraft for the first time landed on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier at sea. Lieutenant Commander Brown and his vampire had certainly made it look easy somewhere off the Isle of Wight. I did the first jet deck landing on the 3rd of December, 1945. However, we did not immediately have squadrons of jets in the Navy because they were very short of range and endurance. They just didn't carry enough fuel for naval operations. Now, in an attempt to solve this problem, we went on to a very radical idea called the rubber deck. This was a sort of trampling which you landed the aircraft on its tummy, not on its undercarriage. The removal of the undercarriage was deliberate to save 7% of the all-up weight of the aircraft. If we could save that, we could transfer that into fuel, get longer range. The rubber deck was never adopted. It would have been too costly and impractical to provide enough of them. Getting jets off a carrier was just as much of a problem. Using dummy bundles at first, HMS Perseus tests the Navy's new steam-operated catapult. With the new system, planes can be launched from a stationary ship. Here goes a radio-controlled pilotless plane. Without the catapult, it would have been impossible for jets to operate at sea. The paddle officer was replaced by the mirror landing site in which a beam of light gave the pilot a correct approach to the ship. Another British innovation was the angled deck. Jets could go around again in safety if they missed the arrestor wires. Naval flying was changing with the times. In the old days, if you did a good deck landing, it was a beautiful thing. It was like a piece of ballet dancing. And uh, people used to come out and watch and clap. And the pilot would be set for by the captain and congratulated. And it was lovely. And so all these old, bold pilots thought, uh, really, we can't do away with this system. We're the chaps who can do it. But faster aeroplanes came along. The action rate was going up a lot. And the system I went for, it involved having the aircraft flying at a constant speed down a straight line, which simply intersected the deck. So this thing crashes on it. The engines scream up in revs because if he didn't catch a wire, he's then got the power on to um, go straight off the end and round again. It's a, a very brutish, clumsy performance, but it works. Britain and America deployed their aircraft carriers in the Korean War. But as Britain declined as a world power, it was America who built a new generation of even bigger carriers, embodying all the new developments. Aircraft carriers are the backbone of the American fleet. They sail with a battle group of warships to support them. There are 15 of them, each one like a small town, sailing the world's oceans with a population of between five and 6,000 people. The Soviet Union has five, the biggest just over a third the size of an American nuclear carrier. 
All this effort and expenditure is dedicated to one purpose, to be able to deploy aircraft at sea anywhere in the world. Their purpose is clearly to be ready for war. In war or peace, they are a marvel of engineering and of organization. The flight deck of an aircraft carrier is one of the busiest places in existence in which every man knows precisely what he is supposed to do, and he does it in harmony with the others. The organization and the discipline is extraordinary. And it's amazing when you recognize the average age of the people on the entire ship was 19.6 years old. Built as a central part of a superpower navy, America's modern carriers have never fought a naval battle. They have been used to project American power around the world. The most significant deployment was in the Vietnam War. They served as floating airfields off the coast, from which airstrikes could be launched immune to guerrilla attack. I had never seen air power from an aircraft carrier used so effectively. I do not think the United States could have prosecuted the war in North Vietnam without aircraft carriers. Carrier pilots in Vietnam did the same jobs as land-based pilots did. Bombing the enemy, providing close support for ground troops, and fighting battles for control of the skies. With her diminished role in the world, Britain scrapped the last of her big carriers. To provide the surface fleet with air cover, the Royal Navy now has three small carriers known as through-deck cruisers. They fly sea harriers, vertical takeoff and landing fighters, which do not need catapults or arrestor cables. The harrier is yet another development in the business of getting high-performance aircraft on and off ships. Just another technique which Navy pilots have to learn. It's an extraordinary feeling when you first do it after having done conventional deck landings. In the hover, you say, oh, I want to land over there. You tip the aeroplane in that direction slightly. You move towards it, tip it back, reduce the power a little bit, and land on the spot. It's that easy, and it makes a world of difference to the dangers of flying at sea. In 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, the British colony in the South Atlantic. The only way to win back the islands was to send a task force to invade from the sea. The air cover would come from ship-borne Harriers. The Argentinian Navy's only aircraft carrier was too vulnerable to put to sea. Air Force and Navy pilots had to operate from land bases. Their priority, to sink ships in the British task force before they could reach the Falklands, in particular, the carriers. Sea Harrier pilots flew 1,600 sorties. They shot down over 20 jet fighters in air combat for the loss of two pilots and six aircraft. Nevertheless, Argentinian aircraft did get through to sink six British ships, once again demonstrating how vulnerable surface ships are to air attack. HMS Sheffield was hit by an Exocet sea-skimming missile launched from an aircraft. The threat from exosets kept the British carriers nearly 300 miles from the Falklands. From there, it was difficult to provide all the air cover which was needed. Argentinian aircraft took a heavy toll on the task force as it landed. The weather in the South Atlantic was often so bad that the Harriers could not fly and the soldiers had to fight without the critical air support they needed. Carriers had only about 25 minutes flying time over the Falklands. 
but they were able to give the soldiers support as they closed in on the capital, Port Stanley. Roger, a bit plus of where we were aiming. Bomb start. Right. There's bomb. Right on. Got it. Roger, I can now confirm that the bomb actually landed on the mark. Over. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Pretty marvellous. <laughs> Without naval aircraft, it is impossible to see how the Falklands could have been retaken. It was not the kind of war for which Britain was prepared, nor the type of war for which the Navy was equipped. It would have been better for us if we'd had uh, F-14s with their Phoenix missiles. There's no question of that. We went down there on a song and a prayer, hoping that what we had was going to be sufficient. I'd much prefer to have three or four American strike carriers with us doing the job. The U.S. carriers not only patrol the world's oceans, in peacetime, they act as roving ambassadors for America. In a war, they would be very vulnerable to attack both from the air and from under the sea. Submarines still pose a great threat to all surface ships, including aircraft carriers. And carriers sail with a battle group of warships for protection. Long-range patrol aircraft and ships are equipped with a dazzling array of electronic defenses against torpedoes and missiles. Only war would show how effective they are. Carriers play a crucial role in the United States Navy, but they would be useless without pilots. Carrier operations and carrier landings are probably the most exciting thing a young man or woman could do. And uh, we are actively recruiting young pilots. So youngsters who want to become naval aviators and want to have a future in this business uh, will have one well in the 21st century. It's now 50 years since the attacks on Taranto and the Bismarck pointed the way ahead in naval warfare. But whether it is a modern jet or a swordfish, landing on a postage stamp in the ocean doesn't get any easier. 